Okay, a slight departure from our normal schedule. Um, Mr. Galbraith, we were unable to get whoever that guy was. <laughs> Show and shield, sorry. Um, Mr. Galbraith will be talking to you about his favorite, favorite topic. All right, uh, the reason for the alarm clock uh, question was because, in fact, Tobin did sleep through his alarm and that's why he's not here today. Um, so, uh, I don't know how many of you know this, but um, my background actually is in artificial intelligence. I have my master's degree in that. Um, it's a topic that I love. It's ironically one of the reasons I went into teaching is because um, when you're looking at uh, how do machines learn, the best way to figure that out is to look at how humans learn. And it turns out teaching involves how humans learn too. So there's actually a lot of uh, places that they overlap. So. Um, so one more, I think. So I actually uh, ended up going into computer science um, with a variety of minors and went ended, up, ended up going to University of Oregon to get my master's degree in computer science and focused on artificial intelligence. Um, a lot of the things that I looked into were neural networks. Uh, I actually did some research with a Lewis and Clark professor and got published on how to play the game of Go really well. Although, ironically, later on, there was another company that ended up beating us at a master's level program. So we didn't quite get to the point that that company did, but that was Google as well. So small research team, Google. There we go. Right. So artificial intelligence, we have to kind of start with what does intelligence mean? So what is the basics of that? So let me put that out first. Who, who thinks they know what is intelligence? A mix of knowledge and creativity. That's pretty good. Um, anyone else have anything else they might add? Yeah. Ability to learn. Ability to learn. Okay. Anybody else have anything? Can we get it even more basic? Like, what is the most basic form of intelligence? Like, is a one cell organism intelligent? It has a job. It has a job? It has a resume. It has a resume. <laughs> What's that? It does the thing. It does whatever it's supposed to do. So it's got some task it can accomplish. So when we talk about machines and what is intelligence, you can kind of get into these very basic questions of what intelligence even means and how we um, ascribe intelligence to machines and how they act. So. so to start with, one of the things that began the field of AI was Alan Turing. You may know him from uh, the person who broke the Enigma machine during uh, World War II. Uh, he was one of the pioneers in creating computers, and he came up with this thing called the Turing test. So, go ahead. That's him. So, the Turing test is a way of trying to figure out if a machine is intelligent, intelligent or not. It's, the fundamentals of it are, if I have a wall and I'm communicating across it, can I tell if the thing on the other side of the wall is a human or is it a computer? Keep going. So this is kind of an illustration of it. So if I have a whole bunch of uh, times that I communicate across a wall, and some of the time it's human, and some of the time it's a machine, will I be able to tell the difference between those? And you could think of this as like you're in a chat room or whatever it is. How do I know that the person on the other side is a computer or is it a human? So there's a problem here, though. If you make it too perfect, there are some things that intellig are intelligent behaviors, but people don't do. So for example, if you look at spelling, people don't do that, like not very well at all. Now there's also things that people do that are just kind of stupid, like I imagine if I gave you guys all a Cleverbot chatbot and I actually looked at the transcript of what you guys typed in, there'd be a lot of stupid things that would end up showing up. Just because you're trying to see if you can break the computer, right? You might say like, hi, seven or eight times. And that's something a human would do, but it doesn't seem intelligent from the point of view of like, is this actually making sense? And so that ends up being a real problem with the Turing test, is how do you figure out that the thing on the other side is a human or not? So you wanna click on Cleverbot? So here's a really basic one called Cleverbot. So the idea with Cleverbot is that 
it takes what other people have said. So if you say something, it tries to look up a database of things that people have said and what the response was. And so it's just basically parroting back a response that someone else has done in the past. So what should we say to Cleverbot? Okay, go for it. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. Are we going to get a response? It's not morning. Okay. So, what would be the next thing? What should we reply to this? It's 929. It's 929. Are you looking at a clock? Okay, it's a reasonable thing. What should we say now? Yes. 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 Grabs. <laughs> we apparently don't have a clock anymore. So, all of these things are program responses. Now, one of the ways you can trick Cleverbot, though, is you can say something that it's never seen before, and it will have no really good response. It's just trying to guess after that point. Um, I think that's probably enough for that. Um, and if you guys go and try it out, that's uh, certainly something you'll find. And you can go on to the next one. So, the next thing. Has anybody heard of Tay? So Tay was this uh, chatbot that Microsoft developed, and they were trying to get it to be as very intelligent and learn from the things that it found on the internet. Well, here's the problem. Within a day, people had figured out the algorithms that had made Tay work, and it became known as like this racist, like pro um, putting out Nazi propaganda, swearing all the time, and like within a day, they had to shut it down. Um, and it was just because of the way that it was learning. So if you take like the Cleverbot thing to an extreme, then you get something like Tay. It was an interesting experiment. It was a very uh, intelligent thing. It took a lot of data, but there were some unintended consequences of that. And you could argue that Tay actually did represent the internet in a lot of ways, but um, there's a problem with the way that works for the Turing test. So, And then Alexa, I don't know if you heard about this that at its point, one point, Alexa was laughing. So Alexa is one of those little uh, uh, machines that you can give it commands. So you say, hello, Alexa, do this thing for me. Or you could do that with Siri or Google or any of those assistants. At one point, um, people were starting to notice that every time that they, in weird times, Alexa would start laughing. And they were like, is it developing intelligence? What is going on here? Uh, they ended up uh, turning that particular feature off. It, when they started analyzing it, what they think was happening is that Alexa was um, thinking that you were telling it to laugh. And that's why it was laughing, even though it was kind of this creepy laugh. Um, and that, one of the hard things about this is that with a lot of these systems, behavior comes out of it that we don't expect. It wasn't something that we programmed in. So as a programmer, what I'm used to is that everything that goes into a program is something I put there. It was intentionally there because I made it so. When we get into the realm of artificial intelligence, what we do is we set up systems and we kind of have expected outcomes, but there are things that come out of it that we don't expect. And that's where like Tay and Alexa start coming from. And there's all sorts of interesting ethics that come into this and like, should we be doing this? So, right. So sometimes taking all of the world and natural language is too hard. So what happens if we just simplify the problem? So one way to look at this is games. Board games, simple games, things like that. So go ahead. So one nice thing is that there's a variety of different games that are different difficulties. So if you take something like um, tic-tac-toe, we've pretty much solved that. We can, on, even in our class, like we can get to the end of the possibilities. We know that a perfect game, we can solve it. Um, this is from XKCD, if anybody's read that. Um, Connect 4, we've even gotten to. Gomoku is... Uh, a more complicated version of tic-tac-toe, but it's more uh, in a row with a larger board. And checkers, uh, we have solved it to the where 
we have figured out all the possibilities from a starting position. There's some interesting things where if you don't begin at the beginning and show it a particular set of moves that you have arbitrarily made, it won't be able to solve it. But from the beginning of the game, it's basically solved. Uh, then we get into things like um, chess. So the problem with chess is there's infinite loops. You can have uh, things that go back and forth an infinite number of times. So how do we deal with that? Um, with chess, there's a lot of things where like you can look at opening games, final games, and kind of know what's going on, and the middle is kind of a muddled mess. But there's a huge number of possibilities. There's something like 10 to the 8th numbers of possibilities in the first 10 moves. Like, that is a lot of possibilities. It gets really bad when you get down here to things like Go. So Go is a game that is played on a 19 by 19 board, and basically you can play on any empty spot. And so, in the first move, you have 19 by 19, and then the next move, each of those multiplied by 19 by 19, and you get into billions of moves within three or four moves. And even computers cry at that point. <laughs> All right, so go ahead. So this is, uh, kind of shows an example of, like, this is like the board state. If you look all the way into the future, what are the best possible moves? There's something called the minimax algorithm, where it look, if I play perfectly as an X player, I always choose the best board. If I'm the O player, I always choose the worst board from X's perspective. And so there's a way of actually solving this completely by looking all at all possible future states. Okay. So chess was one of the big ones that happened earlier. Uh, IBM uh, created this machine called Deep Blue. It had special electronics that were specific to chess, and it had a huge library of openings. So it basically had a lookup table where it's like, I'm just going to look the first 10 moves. I'm just going to have a lookup table of what the best 10 moves are, and I'm just going to look it up. I'm not going to look in the future, nothing like that. I'm just going to go find that move and just play it. And so it used that, and then uh, a whole bunch of algorithms for looking into the future, kind of the way that tic-tac-toe was uh, to try and figure out the best possible move. It would basically find the numerical value for what it thought all of these were. And it actually ended up beating um, Kasparov in a pretty famous match. And so at that point, we're like, okay, we've got that solved. So go ahead. Have you heard of Watson, the Jeopardy computer? So also from IBM. Watson uh, was able to, it was trained on a whole bunch of different questions and was trained to win at Jeopardy. So it was very good at picking up clues about the way that questions were worded so that it could ring in before humans could. Um, but it had a lot of natural language processing inside of it. And one of the interesting things that's come out of this is now they're trying to use Watson in other applications. So we actually have a Sunset student that works on Watson. Um, for medical applications. So they're trying to actually figure out what, um, if you can actually feed it information by talking to it, can it make diagnoses? And so it's trying to use that technology in a new field. And that's one of the goals of AI is like, well, chess or Jeopardy may not seem like a really good use of AI, it's like a silly game, right? But can we take that and actually move it to a new field? So. Uh, Go, this is that one that I was mentioning where like computers cry in it. Um, there are some interesting applications that came out of this. So AlphaGo is the one that just uh, beat a uh, Go professional, which we didn't think would happen like in this period of time. It actually does a lot with pattern recognition and planning. So it looks at states of the board that it's um, and looks at future possible future moves to figure out what's going to happen. But one of the problems with Go is that a couple of key moves make it so that it drastically changes how the game's going to play. And it's a really key piece that may be important to the whole game. Um, it's also hard to tell us who's going to win because of that. So you may look at a board and be like, I can't tell who's winning because it may be that these key pieces are very important to who's going to win. Um, so one of the uh, big things that we found out with Go, though, is there's a way to basically take a particular board and pass out that information to lots of computers and let them all work on the problem. And that was actually how they ended up solving it, was being able to distribute it to supercomputer clusters and that kind of thing in order to solve it. So that's not a real satisfying way to do it, but it is an interesting way that they actually solved it. Good. Okay, so are there ways that we can just take the things that we're working with and structure it in a different way so that it acts like it's intelligent. So, go ahead. 
So that's where we get into things like decision trees, state machines, and this thing called a Bayesian network, where if we can actually just organize data in a very particular way, it acts really smart. So go ahead. And... So a decision tree. Um, decision tree is a really basic idea. You basically ask the decision tree, well, the decision tree at the very top of it has a question for you. It says, like, should I go left or right? And you say left or right, and it goes down to the next step, and it asks you another question, and then it asks you another question. And once you eventually get down far enough, you get to the point where it tells you what the answer is. So if you've ever played the game 20 Questions, where you have to try and get it to um, get a particular thing you're thinking of, and you ask a whole bunch of questions, and eventually it comes up with an answer, that's an example of a decision tree. So go ahead. So a really basic one might be like, should they give you a credit? Um, should they open an account for you? So they ask if you're what your age is. Should they give you a credit rate? Should they ask for credit rating? Are you a student? Like this might be a really basic thing for a company as to whether or not they give you a loan, or they might have something similar for like, should you get your license? Or there may be some sort of script like this, which is the company uses. This is a decision tree, and. This doesn't seem like intelligent behavior, but you're getting at something that gives you a yes or a no answer. Okay? Now, it could be really complicated. It could look like this instead. So maybe like each of these spots is a question, and based on how you answer, it goes to various other levels. And probably, if you ever have played one of those 20 question games, it probably looks even more complex than this, where it's trying to get that information. Go ahead. Another way of trying to make something seem intelligent is something called a state machine. So, so a really basic state machine might be this machine here. So it's either in a lock state or an unlock state. And basically, if you feed in a coin, it's, the arrow shows you where you go. You could feed in another coin and it would stay unlocked. And then when you push on the turnstile, you're back in the lock position. So this machine, do you think this is intelligent? Kind of making a decision, right? What about a vending machine? A vending machine is very much using one of these state diagrams. So you have you put in enough money to get the thing that you're supposed to be getting out. It's actually using something like the state machine to act intelligent. So this is another way that we can kind of simulate intelligent behavior using a pretty basic uh, model. Um, so this shows up all the time in video game design. Um, where you might be in like a particular state, so you're in the waiting state, and when you uh, press up, you are now jumping. And this is a way to kind of act like you're doing intelligent behavior, and all you're looking at is, I'm in this particular state, what inputs do I get? I'm gonna change what my output is based on that. Go ahead. Uh, Bayesian network, uh, go ahead with that. So the idea with this is that um, instead of just having like a true or a false value, what if I assign it a percentage chance? So what if I am like 30% likely to get that this is true or not? This is something that's used in spam filters. So um, they actually run a, one of the a piece of spam through a Bayesian network, and it gives them a percentage chance that it's actually a piece of spam or not. Um, and then what they can do is they can update all of these percentages based on whether or not it actually was a piece of spam. So this is another way that we're trying to get at, is it acting in a behavior intelligent way, and is it actually making good decisions? So if you go to the next one. So this is a GIF that kind of shows a Bayesian network that's dealing with uh, diagnoses for medicine. So if you have these particular aspects, if you can tell whether or not they are true or false, it tries to update all the percentage values of how likely it is that you have a particular disease, like tuberculosis of cancer, should you actually get an x-ray. And so a lot of medical practices are using things like this system now, where they're trying to automate some of the responses rather than trying to leave it just up to doctors. And it's up to you whether you think like that's a good idea or a bad idea, but this is a real system that they're actually trying to use. Okay, what if we like, so intelligence seems to be coming from nature somehow. So is there a way we can take like what we see in nature and then just apply that to machines? Is that gonna make it better? Are we gonna get intelligence out of that? And there's a number of systems that have been developed that are trying to do this. 
So two in particular are neural networks, and which is a simulation based on the brain, and genetic algorithms, which is a simulation based on DNA. So, um, so basically, the way that neurons seem to work, as far as we can tell, is you have these um, cells that have kind of sensors, and when they are triggered enough, they fire, which tri uh, triggers other sensors, other cells. And the strength of that um, signal, like when enough of these neurons fire together, that's what causes the next neuron to fire. And over time, if it fires a lot, that cell gets stronger and it strengthens the signal. And if it doesn't fire very often, it slowly kind of decays and gets weaker. And so it's kind of creating this network of signals that pass through. Okay. So we use uh, mathematics to simulate this. So if we look at, on this side, we have these inputs coming in. This might be like a camera, or it might be like the keys that you've typed. Those are your things coming in. And basically all these arrows is it's the, how strongly that thing should be multiplied going to the next layer. And if like you add, take all these inputs, multiply them and sum it up here, if it's strong enough, that signals this thing to fire and it sends it out to the outputs. And same thing with all of these different layers. And then hopefully then you get an output and it says, yes, this is an A from your handwriting recognition or a C or a D or whatever it is. Um, usually what we do then is we train it so that we say we have some test data which says, yes, that is an A. All of these things you multiply by make those a little stronger because obviously that was a good answer. Well, what if it's a D instead? Then we say, no, that was wrong. And when all of the things that strongly signaled that we should call it an A, we basically make those a little smaller. So it's a way of learning over time that all of these things, um, these multipliers get updated to more closely match the data we want. And this is a pretty common technique for um, a lot of the um, uh, deep learning that's going on in Facebook and uh, uh, Amazon right now. So a lot of them are using some variant of this neural network. There's a lot of uh, different kinds of networks that they're using, but this is pretty common practice right now for them trying to make intelligent decisions with their robots and software bots. All right, genetic algorithms, go ahead. So another way of looking at genetic algorithms are uh, to make intelligent behavior that emerges over time is to use something called um, genetic algorithms where you basically take your program, which is a bunch of zeros and ones, um, and you call that a gene. So you have particular aspects of your program that are these different genes. And basically you take a whole bunch of them, you spawn them, and you have some sort of competition that um, says whether or not they were a good piece of code or not. So that might be like, are, in the similar thing like handwriting recognition, is it an A or is it not? And each of the different like uh, genetic algorithms you spawn will give you answers. And you take the ones that were good answers and you splice their genes together. So you choose some from the first one, you choose some from the second one, and you come out with an offspring that is a new generation of code. And maybe you put in like a mutation algorithm which like randomly flips one of these bits to see what happens, and then you run it again. And so over time, the goal is that these generations of code are actually getting better and better at whatever task it is that you've assigned them. Um, the, you have some interesting problems that show up in this where like if you have, um, eventually sometimes you'll get a whole generation where they're all the same but there's some other kind, uh, generation from earlier that would clearly beat them. And so there's a little bit of uh, technique in trying to make sure that you don't just get like one population that's all exactly the same. But it's an interesting technique. Okay. So here's an example of a genetic algorithm that's trying to solve something called the traveling salesman problem, where you have to go to a bunch of different cities and you're trying to find the minimum path to get there. And so these are like generations that are spawning and over time, the ones that have the best path are the ones that survive into the next round. And so this is something that might be of use to, for example, uh, airlines. If they're trying to figure out how to schedule enough uh, seats for people to go to different places, this is probably pretty key, right? It's important. Um, one of the problems with uh, problems like this is that it's another one of those computational explosion problems. If I looked at every possibility, 
there isn't enough time in the world with all the computing power to actually solve a lot of these problems. And so they have, airlines still need to have a good enough answer. And so they'll use techniques like this where hopefully if they spawn enough random things, eventually it'll get to a good enough solution and they'll be able to continue on. Okay, so what about the real world? What kind of intelligence do we see there? Go ahead. So now we're getting into robots and autonomous vehicles, which is like AI, not just on a computer, but like actually doing stuff that seems more real. So, um, I, this is probably an outdated video actually, now that I think about it, but you wanna click on the Boston Dynamics? So Boston Dynamics is a pretty famous company that, um, skip the ad, skip the ad. So they make a bunch of different kinds of robots. Um, some of them are uh, humanoid, some of them are more like animals. Um, so this was 2013, this robot is much better than it was then. But they're starting to actually get into the point where it's actually behaving more like a, hu a real human. Oh, you're gonna find that one. <laughs> so it used to be that like, when we were talking about robots, there's just no way. Like robots would get stuck on like the little liner between doorways and would fall over, right? Um, but we're getting to the point now where some of these things can actually start to do much more sophisticated behaviors. So this robot can uh, like pick things up and move them around like in a warehouse setting. And all of a sudden, like all those people that have Amazon jobs, that's starting to look a little more dicey, doesn't it? Um, and there's actually some generalized robots as well that are able to learn tasks over time as well. So, um, <laughs> there we go. Amazon, that's your job in Amazon. It's already gone. Now, that's a very complicated problem. So they have been working a very long time on this problem. This is not something that's really simple and has been solved. But it is getting to the point now where we have real machines doing real tasks in the real world that um, it seems like are doing intelligent behavior. Um, if you haven't heard of it, um, I don't have a link here, but uh, CGP Gray does an excellent thing about uh, talk. He's one of the uh, authors on YouTube about how your job is likely to be taken by robots if you're doing very particular things. Um, any kind of menial task, robots are probably going to take over in the near future. Humans need not apply. Um, if you haven't had a chance to look at that, it's well worth looking at. Now, one thing that robots are not as good at, though, is the like creative aspects. So if you're creating something from scratch, that's something that they're not going to be able to solve for a while. So if you're in like a tech field where you're creating technology, then you're much safer than if you are going to be pushing papers around on a desk. Um, I think we can go on to the next one. Autonomous cars. So, autonomous cars are not only coming, but in some places they're here. So, we have a company in town named Daimler. Uh, they make semis. And trucking is a huge industry. Like, there's probably millions of jobs, I believe. Six million jobs in trucking. All of a sudden, their semis that might be able to drive themselves on simple t routes have like taken all of those jobs away. Um, autonomous cars are a hard problem. We're not there yet. Um, we were just talking earlier about how if it gets icy, all of a sudden, does your robot actually perform correctly? But there's some interesting um, ethical issues that show up in this. So do you want to do the MIT moral machine? <laughs> So it seems like philosophy and computer science, like those aren't the same fields, right? Well, let's go ahead and start judging. What if you're presented with a situation as a car and you have to decide, are you going to swerve into the other lane and hit these people because your brakes have failed or are you going to hit these people? There's actually a famous philosophy problem called the trolley problem, except that now your car has got to make this decision. And the thing is that this may seem kind of contrived, but someone's got to write the code for how your car steers. So a programmer might have to make this decision of like, if my brakes fail, do I go straight? Do I turn? Do I avoid pedestrians? Do I try and like kill the passengers in the car itself? <laughs> Seems kind of morbid, I admit. Um, but suddenly, someone's got to make this decision. 
And there's an interesting question of who should make this decision. Should it be whoever's programming the car? Do you feel comfortable if like some person you've never heard of before that's programming at a company like, I don't know, Chrysler, is making a decision for whether or not you're going to die in a car crash or the pedestrian outside is in a car crash? Should that be something that the company decides? Do you trust Toyota? Do you trust uh, BMW? Maybe do the different companies have different things. Maybe BMW decides, you know, their well-paying customers should be saved every time. And maybe Toyota's like, well, let's minimize death and so whatever the least casualties is. So is that okay? <laughs> do you trust lawmakers to make this decision? Should we like trust whichever party's in power? Like they get to decide how this is? Or maybe, maybe when you get into a car, uh, right before you uh, tell it to go to your destination, you're like, okay, put in your preference of the order of you would want people to die in a crash, and then it's on the customer, right? <laughs> and then it's on you, right? So you're the legally bound. But these are real problems that we're trying to get at. So the reason that this uh, MIT Moral Machine exists is MIT is trying to get a sense of how people feel about this. <laughs> Yeah, so do you care about the dog or not? So. so do you want to complete this real quick? Just <laughs> Let's get at the statistics. So we're going to do kind of a random sampling, but... <laughs> Lots of people are dying. So then they show you the statistics at the end. Now the interesting piece is this others thing. So this is kind of a sampling of what all people have decided. And so what MIT is trying to get at here is what does society feel about this? Like what should they put in their cars? Should this be like something that lawmakers take a look at? Do they take this data and say, oh, you know what we should do? We should make sure that people that are like legally crossing the street die a lot less than people that are jaywalking. Maybe that's something that should be put into law. So that's where um, this gets really interesting. And they just released a report where they actually looked at different countries. So for the, uh, a lot of the countries in Eastern Asia, they have a much higher rate of saving older people. Whereas the people in Latin America and the United States have a much stronger tendency to save the young people. There's an interesting thing there, like, is that cultural history that's really causing that? Do you honor your elders or not? So, what do you guys think? Do you think that you should save young people or old people? <laughs> Even though I am more valuable than all of you because I know so much more? <laughs> Just a thought. <laughs> all right. So let's go to the next one. Now... One of the interesting things that's been helping us to improve is that there's a lot more advances in sensors. So if you think about it, like cameras used to be a very large thing, and they keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller. You all have them in your phones now, I'm assuming. Um, and so as this technology gets smaller, we can add more sensors into this uh, car. Now there's some interesting problems that because there's so many of these inputs coming in, all these um, things that the car is trying to put together to make decisions, there are some very hard cybersecurity problems with this. What happens if I can fool a bunch of these sensors and make the car do something that it didn't intend to do in the first place? Like I happen to like white out some of the cameras and all of a sudden it thinks it's snowing and it changes the behavior of it. What if I can cause a, it to crash because of that? Um, what if I can spoof the Wi-Fi? So there was a problem for a while where there were some truckers that were using, um, so they had little GPS trackers and they would actually use a spoofing technique so their employers didn't know where they were driving if they wanted to take a side trip. Um, but the problem was this device was starting when they drove by airports was interfering with airplanes, which, you know, is kind of a problem. Um, so there's a lot of uh, cyber questions here, cybersecurity questions that need to be answered too. How comfortable are you letting a car drive? Um, but also, on the other hand, what happens if, um, so let's say that 100,000 people die in car accidents in autonomous vehicles. Should we look at it from the perspective of that many people died, or should we look at it from the perspective of when humans were driving, it was way more. 
So is that better or not? Or should we like really take a look at the autonomous vehicles are really the problem? Um, okay. Okay, so credits on the slideshow. I just wanted to kind of give you a brief overview of a variety of different fields of artificial intelligence. Does anybody have any questions about any of the pieces that I talked about? Any strong opinions on who should die in car accidents? Yeah. Do they do anything to fix Tay? Did they do anything to fix Tay? I have not heard anything. They, uh, yeah, they turned it off. They turned it off immediately. Okay, the internet is a scary, horrible place. We're not going to do that again. Uh, they kept the original code, but they didn't necessarily go back and fix the original. They said that is the data set that it learned from, and that's what it learned. Yeah. Um, going back to Tay, um, they actually turned her into a snake bot, and like yeah. added a filter to her and restricted her a lot more. Apparently, Microsoft had a similar thing, basically, in the same code for tables used in um, Asia on some on the Asian social media site, and it worked pretty well. Um, and then it, it didn't go into the uh, NFL screen at one point on Twitter. Right. Um, I actually interacted with Tay when she first came out on Twitter. Um, and it was funny because um, the, like in the first few days, the developers were, were iterating Tay really fast, trying to um, change it so it wouldn't well, see the, uh, these Nazi images. And it would work for like an hour or two, and then people would find a way to screw with it again. And then pretty soon, um, they just added a filter to her. So if you like, like cuss, like if you cuss, talk in her face, what was on. Right. But people found a way to get around that. So it was, yeah, so they didn't think of the security in any of these things, and people are clever on the internet, so <laughs> they figured out ways around it. Interesting. Any other questions about these fields? Okay, let's take a... Yeah, let's do about a four-minute break. If you're going to use the bathroom, make sure you use the main hall ones. Don't linger in the hallway. There are other classes going on. And make sure you go back here in time. And we'll start in a little bit. Robots that are like learning like babies now, like they like I know at Michigan they have a they have a robot that yes uh, just like as a robot. 